Good afternoon. It's again Friday, so it's time for me to deliver another lecture. Uh, we ended the last one with Aaron Berger asking me to make some comment or comments about a client I thought of that had particularly influenced uh, what I what I came to believe and what I came to become. And I, I had started already when I first uh, got into an early lecture talking about the first client I had when I arrived in private practice, the middle-aged woman who had a 20-ish daughter who was a prostitute and a heroin addict uh, who were waiting for me in my waiting room in great agitation. And how I felt overwhelmed, confused, without anything that I had ever learned that seemed to provide me any basis for proceeding with them, and how I simply referred them out and washed my hands of this overwhelming and confusing mess that had shown up in my waiting room. And that, that had sent me on the beginnings of a long search for who I was, what I believed, and how I could respond much more broadly to the array of human troubles that were going to show up in my office. But today I want to talk about an early client who had a profound effect on me. And I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, this may turn out to be quite boring because I'm going to read you a chapter from a book I have been working on. It's a book about my life experiences as a psychologist. And this chapter is devoted to my uh, encountering him in my life. Uh, reading may turn out to be boring, so I may have to scratch this whole episode, but I'm gonna try it and see how it turns out, whether it's interesting or not. The title of the chapter is, I couldn't stand it because working with him did drive me to extreme desperation of a kind you'll hear about as, as, I, as the reading unfolds. My entire set of interactions with Ken appear to me in retrospect to have been a strange melange. No, strange is not quite the right word, almost mystical. We met peculiarly, we knew each other peculiarly, and he passed out of my life peculiarly. I didn't know then, nor do I know yet, if my participation in his life had any meaning for him whatsoever. For me, though, the moments we shared together changed my consciousness irrevocably. And I cannot even think of Ken without a lump in my throat, a feeling of reverence, and an aching longing to transcend the bounds of ordinary reality. It was the early 1960s when Ken and I discovered each other. The world was just beginning to go mad, or at least more mad than it had seemed to me during most of the years of my life. The Vietnam War raged on. John F. Kennedy had been assassinated, and Martin Luther King's assassination followed soon thereafter. Yet it was a time of hope as well as a time of craziness. Lyndon Johnson had become president of the United States and was trying to shape a, quote, great society, close quotes. Edmund G. Brown was governor of California and was wanting to bring social justice and goodness to the populace of his state. For the first time in a long time, large appropriations of money were being thrown at seeking solutions to intractable social problems more allocations that have been made at any period in the country's evolution since the Great Depression of my childhood. I have always been one to seek some sustaining involvement in the affairs of the larger society surrounding those two small islands of security and goodness in which I lived most of the hours of my life, my home and the office in which I practice psychology. The era's quickening pace of events, the ferment of social change, and disruption, the availability of possibilities for a meaningful engagement, led me once more to cast a bot to, for the answer to the question of where in the great social movement beginning to unfold, might I find a worthwhile place to make a personal investment of my energies. At the time I am remembering, the legislature of the state had made a decision to use some of California's revenues to seek better solutions to the problems of delinquency, gang violence, and the production of criminal identity among disadvantaged urban youth. As one prong of the, Cal of the attack, the California Youth Authority, that instrumentality of state governance charged with incarcerating 
punishing and, quote, rehabilitating, close quotes, serious felonious offenders between the ages of 12 and 18 was given the funds to engage in programs of crime prevention. The CYA had decided to use some of the windfall of special revenues suddenly made available to establish community delinquency prevention centers in the worst ghettos of the state. The centers were to be staffed with CYA parole officers who had been identified by their superiors as the most sophisticated and sensitive of the lot. The charge to the center staff would be that they alter their identities. Instead of seeing themselves as agents of social control, as quasi-cops responsible for making sure the terms and conditions of parole were observed by the youth in their care, they were to be pulled offline. Their caseloads would be reduced to 20 parolees instead of the previous 120 that had traditionally been entrusted to their oversight. And their new directive was to do what they might invent to do in order to redeem the lives of their charges, establishing close relationships with them, mentoring them, acting as big brothers, as, uh, and turning themselves into social workers and advocates. And I found myself securing a position as a psychology consultant to one of the most difficult centers, one situated on the northern fringes of Watts, South Central Los Angeles. Ken was one of the staff POs assigned to the new agency. I began a process of going to my new challenge at the center for a couple hours, one morning each week. The assignments given to me by the director seem at first to be quite simple ones. He wanted my, my help with facilitating the passage of his staff into their new roles, and he wanted me to do what I could to keep their morale high. And he wanted me also to be able to provide them with some bits of psychological wisdom if they ran into emotional problems in their young parolees that seemed outside of their common sense expertise. The format for my intervention was to be a two hour group session and the director charged all members of the professional staff with uh, coming out of the field, their field assignments and off the street during those hours in order to attend my group meeting. I spent the next year attempting to honor the terms under which my services have been secured. It was far from easy. It took me about the first six weeks to realize that I could never create an atmosphere conducive for the POs to share any personal distress or any openness to explore their confusions, uncertainties, and personal limitations, so long as the director himself was one of the attendees at the sessions. My new clients, the POs, did not feel safe enough to be real in the presence of the man who had the authority to write their semi-annual evaluations and who had absolute dominion over their tenure and their raises. For the longest time, it was hard for me to persuade him that he had to absent himself from the meetings if I was to do anything effective. At last, though, my arguments prevailed and he became willing to honor my request. With the departure of the <coughs> director, the training group sessions became more raw and more real. Some of the attendees were able to talk about their frustrations, their sense of pointlessness, and their despair in trying to have much meaningful impact on the lives of any of their wards. They felt their efforts were doomed and that the nature of the social order with its textures of poverty, bigotry, lack of access to any redeeming sense of possibilities or permeabilities, and a culture of meaningless violence made recidivism almost a certainty. They themselves felt naked, fraudulent, and vulnerable, where before they could hide behind the hugeness of the CYA system and the impossibility of unmanageable caseloads, now that the structures had changed, they felt themselves on the line without the personal resources, wisdom, or capabilities to make happen what their supervisors told them they should be making happen. I tried to lower the ex expectations of the members of my training group. I attempted to get them to buy into the proposition that the center's entire output, if the center's entire output of effort 
kept only one African-American youth for winding up an habitual member of the state's penal population, then the whole effort would have been worthwhile. I was even able every once in a while to offer some suggestions that actually proved helpful to sustaining one or another of the kids about whom I was hearing weekly complaints and despair. And I did at least a modicum of reasonable work with some of the men with whom I met each week, each Thursday, helping them to lower, lower their levels of stress and giving them some renewed sense of dignity and lightness about their calling. The experience was a very good one for me, was good for some of the men I had met, was an, an indifferent one for still others, and constantly seemed to be a miserable one for Ken. From the first moment Ken appeared and opened his mouth on the first day I began any consulting at the center, I knew I was in for it. He looked like a bantam rooster, slight in stature and wire in build. His body posture was aggressive and cocky. He peered out of crinkled eye sockets with a jeering, street-smart gaze. He was in his middle 40s, and he had been doing this kind of work for about 15 years. No one was going to tell him anything, and he, did, he needed to tell me right away that I specifically was not going to tell him anything. Ken resented being ordered to attend the group. He often announced that the whole thing was a goddamn waste of time. He jeered at shrinks in general and tended to, denig tended to denigrate the comments I made to the group in particular. His way of discounting me over and over again was to tell me that until I had paid my dues, busting my ass trying to supervise the fucked up motherfucking youth who were the responsibility of the center for as many years as he had, I would not know shit. I never argued with Ken. I satisfied myself for letting him know every few weeks that it was apparent to me um, how much of himself he gave to the kids, uh, how sensitively attuned he was to them, how available he made himself when they needed him, and how dependable and incorruptible he was. No one I met in the year I spent at the center cared more about the jobs they had been handed, but I despaired of ever being able to make any emotional bond with Ken. Try as I might, he kept shoving me away. There was a budget cut at the end of my year of service. The director of the center called me into his office. He let me know that he had to make a painful decision and that my weekly seminar was just something that had to be considered expendable, given the dollars he had been handed for the coming year. He told me my presence had meant a lot to many members of his staff and I had helped them to become a mutually engaged and supportive family. For that, he was deeply indebted to me. I thanked him for the chance he had provided me to have learned so much from the work I had been given to do. I told him I had formed some wonderful new friendships with some of the men who participated in the experiment and that my life had been enriched. I was not including Ken among the group to which I was referring. My comments to the director were not meaningless path. For the better part of the subsequent decade, and until life had moved me on in other directions, I had gone on attending social events and parties with some of the men I had met, played tennis occasionally with one of them, and linked couple to couple quite strongly with another, his wife, and my former wife. Ken was not part of the ongoing residual connection that continued to unfold between my life and the lives of some of the center staff. I remember that when I took formal leave from the center, I did not believe I would ever see Ken again. I certainly had no yearning to know him any further. Life proved me wrong on both counts. In the summer of 1967, I, re I received a phone message that I was to call Ken. I was startled. I could not imagine why he was seeking me out again five years after we had parted. It also seemed strange that the telephone number's prefix suggested he was calling from Santa Monica when I knew he worked in South Central Los Angeles and lived in Pasadena. I returned the call immediately and I heard a voice say, St. John's Hospital. My God, I thought, did, Ted quit, did Ken quit being a PO? and become a medical social worker? 
That seems so unlikely to me. I asked for the extension number Ken had left. He picked up the phone. I told him who it was and that I was returning his call. He thanked me. In a weak voice, he said, I want to see you professionally. To remember that I was startled is underplaying the degree of surprise I experienced at that moment. Based on my earlier experience with him, I predicted that he would have been about the least likely candidate to enter psychotherapy with me that I could imagine. But here he was. I pulled out my appointment book. Ken, I'm free tomorrow at 2 p.m. or Thursday at 10.30 in the morning. Do you need a time outside of working hours? I think I could arrange something on Saturday if that would be possible for you. No, you don't understand. I'm in the hospital. I'm a patient. I need you to come and see me here. Oh, Ken, I'm sorry to hear that. What's wrong? I expected to hear that he was convalescing from some surgery or another. I have leukemia. It's bad. I have no one to talk to. Will you come? Of course I'll come. Let me see if I can move the person I ordinarily see at 2.45 tomorrow afternoon. Can you have visitors at 2.30? If I can shift her, I'll be able to spend an hour with you. Yes, please come. I'm in an isolation room all by myself. You can drop by any time that's convenient for you. You'll have to wear a gown and a mask when you come in. They're poisoning me and my immune system is shot. I can't risk any affection, infection. Just stop at the nursing station and someone will explain to you how to get ready. Look, Ken, I don't think there'll be a problem getting my schedule uh, in order and turned around. Unless I call back, I'll see you at 2.30 tomorrow. When the, co with the conversation with Ken left me feeling quite destabilized. Was he dying? Would I have the courage to stand into all of that? What would it be like to be with someone dying? Too many people had died while I was growing up. It had been awful. I hated and dreaded death. <clears throat> Excuse me. I hated and dreaded illness. I hated and dreaded hospitals. Why was he calling me? Why me? He had a wife and two little boys. He had lots of friends. What did he need me for? I thought he had contempt for me. Wouldn't he call some other mental health professional? Anyone but me? I rearranged my schedule and reached the hospital a few minutes before the time I had promised Ken I would join him. The ward nurse told me that I would have to scrub, then put on a hospital gown, a cap, and a mask over the entire lower part of my face, and that I could not touch Ken nor go any closer than two feet from him. She showed me the closet where the strange garb was kept. I dressed myself, puzzled that everything, mask, gown, and cap were all in a bright butter yellow color. Muffled and feeling weighted down by my strange apparel, even though the items were made of very soft cotton material, I approached the door of Ken's room apprehensively. It seemed ominous, ominous to me that the entry into the room was posted with a large strident warning announcing a quarantine of the resident ensconced within. Ken looked like shit. He had always been slight, but I was ill-prepared for how emaciated he had become. He had simply wasted away and appeared to have lost about a third of his body weight and volume. My old new client was dressed in a skimpy hospital gown, white with a blue figure scattered about on it. He was propped up in bed, hooked up to an IV drip. I noticed how loose the plastic hospital ID bracelet had become. It hung down around the broad part of his hand, dangling strangely as askew, as askew as Ken's life. I drew up a chair near the foot of the bed and sat down. I was relieved that I was masked. Instead of finding the cotton stretch over the lower part of my face, the annoyance and the potential impediment to any meaningful conversation I had experienced that as being only a few moments ago, it was suddenly a comfort a mask that would hide from Ken the horror, the sadness, and the revulsion I was so sure must have been written all over my countenance. Ken spoke as soon as I seated myself. Thank God you're here. Ken, what do you need from me? 
In a burst of pressured speech, Ken replied, I got to have someone I can be honest with. The, nurse, the docs and nurses bullshit me, and I bullshit them back. I can't talk to my wife. I have to talk care, take care of her. I can't tell her the truth. I can't let her see how scared, whoops, how scared and how furious I am. See that cocksucking tube and pouch? That's dripping poison into me. It's real strong poison. It makes me sick. It makes me feel like I'm dying. My only hope is that the fucking poison will kill the leukemia faster than it will kill the rest of me. I'm scared all the time. I don't want to die. I'm not ready to die. Who's going to look after my wife? How's she going to survive financially without me? Who's going to raise my kids and pay for college for them? I haven't saved anything. I don't have enough insurance. She's going to have to move to an even crappier apartment in an unsafe neighborhood if I croak. The docs say I got about one chance in eight of getting a remission. Christ, I'm fighting as hard as I can. Look at that poster I put up on the back of the door. I turned to glance where Ken was pointing. It was a striking graphic, a drawing of a clenched fist raised defiantly against the darkening sky. Above it and below the images, Dylan Thomas' famous lines have been etched. Do not go gentle into that good night, but rage, rage against the dying of the light. I muttered some inanity about how miserable it must be to be so frightened and angry. Yeah, I take the angry, anger out on everyone. I can't seem to help. Some nurse just came in here and she's looking sour. So I yell at her, look, bitch, the least you can do is be pleasant when you come around here. Do you think this is some kind of goddamn picnic? Jesus, she didn't deserve that from me. Know what? You don't deserve how shitty I used to be to you either when you used to come down to the unit. You always seem to be trying hard, but I resented you. I've always had trouble with people who acted like some kinds of authority or who treated me shitty. I detest that attitude. You weren't really doing much of that, but I guess I punished you for it anyhow. I lied. I told Ken, Ken, that was never a problem for me. I knew you didn't appreciate the experience I was trying to provide for you and the others. You didn't like being forced to come and you took it out on me. I never felt it to be personal between us. In fact, I remember how much I respected you. Of all the people at the center, you seemed the wisest and the most committed to the project. I always had a great deal of admiration for your way with the kids and for your devotion to trying to reach them. Fat lot of good it ever did me. You sound bitter. You bet your ass I sound bitter. What the fuck did any of it mean? Look at me now, cooped up in this hell hole, losing weight by the day, having my appetite killed by that goddamn poison, having my whole body killed. I gotta wait maybe six, maybe 10 weeks before I know whether or not the treatment has worked and I get a reprieve. And the sons of bitches don't even give me a room with a window so I can look out at anything. Look out that fucker, what do you see? A goddamn blank wall. You can't even see any piece of the sky from here. Is there anything you'd like from me now, Ken? Just tell me if my life makes any sense. No, it doesn't. What you're living is a cruel joke. There's no reason to it at all. You don't deserve it, and I agree that it's fucked. No, no, you don't understand. It's not this crisis I'm talking about. It's not the not knowing whether I'm going to live or die that I want an answer to. It's what I've done with my life up until now. If you want me to make some kind of evaluation, some kind of summing up, Ken, then I need your help. I don't know much about your life. I know you've been a sensitive and dedicated PO, that you have a wife and two small children. Sons, I think. And I do know that you get pissed off when some irrational authority orders you to do something that doesn't make any sense to you. And it enrages you that your life is being threatened. That's about all I have to hang any evaluation on. Not enough for me. Tell me about the rest. Ken took me up on my invitation. That day he began a retrospective review of the meaning of his life. The work we did together stretched out over many weeks. I hated and feared every moment of it. 
Yet I felt privileged to be called upon to bear witness to the effort. It was as if I'd been swept up into a living rendition of Tolstoy's The Death of Ivan Ilyich, only Ken was a man of the 20th century urban American streets, not a landholding petty bourgeois from 19th century Russia. Yet the same question obsessed them both. In the face of impending death, does the life I have lived bear any real meaning? Before I left at the end of my first visit with Ken, I struck a bargain with him. I promised him I would come to see him twice a week. Two possible outcomes he brooded about came to pass. Until he died or until he achieved a remission and was permitted to leave the hospital. If it was to be the latter, we would renegotiate whether or not there would then be any further purpose to our meeting together. I would don my butter yellow shrouds and appear at the appointed times, no matter what Ken might be going through, whether he be lucid or drugged into a stupor of semi-consciousness, or whether he be available for conversation or shut down in an unbearable pain. I kept my bargain with Ken. My knowing him played out over a period of about 14 weeks. During that time, Ken told me the story of his adult life. I know little about his early years. He never focused on them. So my sense of him is incomplete. It does not matter though. He told me plenty. Ken came from a Jewish family with a fierce social conscience. His father had been an officer in the Socialist Labor Party during the 1930s. And Ken had internalized the family's values. As could be guessed, my client was always a good student. And in the 1940s, he entered UCLA on a scholarship intending to major in sociology. He joined the Young Communist League while in the university and soon began to experience a great clash between his values and the textures of his personal life. What the hell was he doing indulging himself on an exceptionally beautiful university campus one that looks like Hollywood's idea of how an institution of higher learning should appear, pleasuring himself with the joy of learning and hanging out with the present and future intellectual elite when so many of his fellow Americans were miserable. After two years of education, Ken came to the conclusion that he did not belong in college. His place was with the proletariat. He dropped out of school. Ken next went to work at the Ford Assembly Plant in Pico Rivera, just to the southeast of downtown Los Angeles. He was assigned to engine installation. While he worked on the assembly line, he attempted to recruit members of the Communist Party from among his fellow workers, most of whom were black. In order to his, inspirit his new companions, during breaks, Ken would sing labor songs to them accompanying himself on a guitar. He also tried to arrange poetry readings using, using selections from the literature of social protest and from the writings of the growing cadre of black authors raising their voices in outrage in post-war America. His intended audience treated him with an affectionate derision. His fellow workers would laugh and call him a honky ass. Their message was that he should forget about them they were trapped. No better life was available to them. He, on the other hand, had an option. Why the fuck had he dropped out of college? He should get his Jew boy white butt back to UCLA as quick as he could and take advantage of the life that was possible for him. Ken fought their despair. He tried to inspire them. He begged them to come to party meetings. He cursed at their sullenness, their futility. In the end, however, the worldview of his fellow workers prevailed. The frustration Ken experienced took its toll. He concluded with great disappointment that he, appointment, that he was a failure and that what he was hearing was correct. Yes, he needed to go back to the university and get his degree. Maybe if he, he secured the credential, he could then enter the power structure and at last be able to do some real good this time from inside the citadel, rather than from his by now traditional posture of feudal attacks on its outer walls. 
My client finished UCLA and graduated summa cum laude in sociology. He went to work immediately at the Youth Authority and was considered a stellar worker within that organization. There were few who ever exhibited Ken's dedication to his charges. He would practically adopt them. He would give them money from the meager salary state government paid him. He would run to their homes in the middle of the night to put out family complications. And over and over again, they would disappoint him and break his heart, stealing again, dealing dope again, joyriding again, committing assault again, and being sent back to the joint again. Yet Ken persevered. Along the way, Ken had married one of the secretaries in a unit to which he had been assigned. She was a young Filipina. He adored her. She was very kind to him. She bore him two sons who were bright as shiny pennies and exuberant about being alive. Ken would often cry as he struggled to let me know how much his kids meant to him. I remember too what a heartbreaking confession was his outcry of remorse about he had neglected both his wife and children and how he had failed ever to acknowledge to them sufficiently their absolute preciousness in his life. Ken sobbed as he related that every once in a while, his wife would sigh with such heaviness and say, why are you leaving your bed and all of us in the middle of this night to go to that kid? Your work abuses you, you're exhausted. You have nothing but disappointments. We are here, me and your boys. We love you, we wanna be with you and you're always gone. You're with everyone else's boys, rotten ones, and not with your own. Won't you let us care for you? We want to matter. We want to fill that horrible hole in you. Ken would not listen, at least until the moments I am remembering, the moments that he was facing his own death. Near the end, it was unbearable for me to have to listen to what he was saying. Thoughts, uh, thoughts I felt might be Ken's final outburst, his ultimate summation of the meaning of his life. I made the wrong moves at every turn. I'm real smart. I could have made a good life for myself. All the guys I went to high school and college with became doctors, lawyers, accountants, dentists. They made a lot of money. They're living in Brentwood or in Palos Verdes. I could have done that too. I had as much or more going for me than they did. Instead, I went out to bust my ass first in the factory and then in South Central. And for what? I never made a damn bit of difference anywhere anyhow. I accomplished shit and I got nothing for myself. I ignored and neglected Josefina and the kids. I live in a dumpy apartment. I have no money to take care of my family if I die. It's been zip, nada, and I can't do any of it over anymore. I cannot remember what the hell of anything I've been trying to say to Ken during the weeks of his emotional anguish and in the presence of his mournful and self excoriating outcries. I think mainly I was just there, muffled my hospital guard, nodding and making noises of understanding and of fellowship. There are, however, three things I do remember the most about my twice a week visits to Ken's bed bedside. I remember how much I felt like some kind of container. His words would poison his bile, spilling out of him and into me. It was my challenge to find some way to hold the self-abnegation within my person. I believe it felt to me to purify it and to neutralize the toxins it contained. I remember how much I hated and raged inside at the deterioration of Ken's body. He shrank down before my very eyes into a thin sheet of translucent parchment. He began to look to me very much like the horrible images I carry of the concentration camp victims I saw in the newsreels in 1945, all skin and bones. He could barely move except to writhe in pain. His voice grew so weak I could hardly hear him. I hated his doctors. They had him hooked up to innumerable tubes. They tied his arms to the bed rails. They kept cutting him, studying his bone marrow, torturing his flesh. He had horrible gashes and purple bruises over most of his shrunken body. His muscles, previously robust and sturdy, hung from his long bones like tired, overstretched rubber bands. I remember sobbing with joy and guilt 
that I was able to go on living and that it was Ken and not me who was dying. I never cried in his presence. I did not want to burden Ken with my distress. Was I a fool? Whom did I cheat? I only know that I would choke back my grief until I left his room. Then as I trashed the gown I had been wearing and tore the cap and mask from my head, I frequently would be racked with grief and with relief. Some of my reactions seemed bizarre to me. I visualized leaving the hospital and walking out on Santa Monica Boulevard. The day I'm remembering was an absolutely miserable August day in Southern California. The smog inversion was at its worst. There was a second stage smog alert in force, even in Santa Monica near the coast. The temperature was over 100. The pedestrians I passed on my way to the car all looked sullen and miserable. But me, I was exuberant, reveling in the joy of being able to breathe, even to breathe the smog deeply into my lungs, to see the sullen sky, to feel my legs moving, to embrace the moments of, of living, knowing that death was still a way down the road for me. I was going to live. Ken was going to die. In the 12th week of my being with Ken, he slipped mercifully into a coma. With the coming of his unconsciousness, I did not want to see him anymore. My desire to flee held in abeyance as long as our conversations were proceeding, flared into a demanding insistence. Besides, I told myself, Ken was out of it and would never know the difference. Nevertheless, I had made a bargain with him, and I too, like Ken, can be a self-depriving schmuck who dies by his commitments. So I forced myself, fighting every inch, inch of the way not to flee, to keep my bargain. The two sides of me battling for control of my behavior would alternate. I would cook up excuses for why I was not able to get away to go to the hospital at, at the appointed, appointed times. Then what I, I would yell at myself to go anyhow. Sometimes in my silence, I would hold Ken's hand for the hour of our being together, feeling fused with his immobility. Sometimes I would bring books and read to him from the literature he loved. I finally let myself cry with him when he was comatose. I do not know if he was ever aware of my presence in his frozen state of unconsciousness. Only then did I feel, did I feel safe to be real. One early September day, I could not go on. The side of me that wanted to flee from all the horror that surrounded Ken had won out. The hell with it. I was not going to make myself miserable anymore for a comatose guy who did not even know I was present. A wave of desperation rose in me. I started to talk to Hermine, the woman who would become my wife, about the unbearable nature of my connection to Ken. In the end, I asked her plaintively if she would come to the hospital with me and pour goodness into me while I forced myself to see my promise through to its end. I told her I did not think I could continue without her help. We made the journey together. She entered the hellhole with me and stood quietly behind, behind me, beside me her arm on my shoulder as I pulled my chair over to Ken's bed and sat down. I could tell that the revulsion gripped her as it did me. I found comfort in that. I took Ken's hand, the one with the IV tube mashed into a vein, my usual ritual. This day while I was holding his hand though, his eyes fluttered and he struggled to speech. Speak, I was startled. I had not expected to have any further human contact with him ever again. I do not know if Ken was hallucinating in his coma, if what we were witnessing was just random neural firing, the last spasms of dying brain matter. I do not know if he was attempting to talk to me. It makes no difference. It took great energy, but finally Ken's words, or the words of the God in whom I do not believe, formed themselves. A beatific smile played itself across his face, his dense pain musculature at last softening into a kind of repose. 
I know what it's all about. I was not certain I had heard him correctly. What it's all about, Ken? Yeah, I know what it's all about. All of it. It's all there. It's, it's just us sitting on Venice Beach on a summer Sunday afternoon. Colors, sky and sea, warm. My Josefina and the boys, the Sunday New York Times, a cold beer in my hand. It's perfect. Those were the last words Ken said to anyone. The words changed my life. I know how they changed Ken's. I'm almost certain he died in peace, forgiving himself and finding his meaning in that elegant, heart-catching simplicity embedded there in so many moments, moments that are present for each of us, moments we never even seem to notice. At least I hope Ken died in peace. Will any of us ever know? Of all those I have met along the track of my life, Ken is the one person I know and have encountered who was most swallowed up by a driven need to matter and to be responsible. He gave away almost all of himself so that those whose lives concerned him could be enriched, a plethora of suffering strangers. He asked his wife and children with a lot of pain for them to join him in sacrifice and in the subordination of self-interest. He and his family were to come last after the entire world's needs had been met. That is, if there was anything at all left over for a form of them. Yet in spite of Ken's oppressive wisdom about noticing, oh no, in, in, excuse me, in spite of Ken's <clears throat> oppressive commitments to self-denial, Ken let me learn from him such precious and delicate wisdom about noticing. I wish I could thank him. I cherish his gift. So many times I remember and I force myself to look. And when I allow myself to see, I know how right he is about what really matters. In the end, he discovered it was not the grand projects to which he devoted himself that inspired his life. No, it was the murmur of the ocean lapping at the sand, or the feel of the breeze and the sun's warmth on his cheek, or the look of the curve of the small of Josefina's back. As his life guttered out, he became so wise. He became his, my teacher. Josefina asked if I would speak at her husband's funeral. I did. I had to stop my remarks in the middle for a few moments until I could contain myself because I was crying too much to go on. It was okay. The bunch from the center was there and additional people I did not know. There were many African-American young men some sullen, some crying. I hope the words I said did Ken's life some justice. I'll never know. Of course, I never sent Josefina a bill for the months I spent with her husband. It just didn't seem right to me to ask her payment. That would have dishonored Ken. Oh, it still gets to me. I still started to cry as I read the ending of that tale. Oh, I'll sit and catch my breath for a few minutes and then I'll proceed. I'll pursue the other thing that was very much in my life before. It's called getting ready to have a love affair. It was about the same period of time. It was in the middle 1960s. The American Psychological Association Convention was being held in Los Angeles that year. And I had gotten together with my old friend, Tom Greeny, who also is now living in Los Angeles. And we decided that at my house, we, we would host a, a, a meeting after one of the day sessions for all the old faculty members and fellow students that we could find who may be attending the convention. And I, I would offer my premises. He, he was living in a small apartment and I had a small house it was a little more spacious and 
we would work out the transportation. We would see how many of them are in the cars. He had his car and I had mine. And in between us, we could, we could uh, carpool, drive many of the guests to the convention to join us. So we went on a, a day early before the day we wanted to plan this event because back then there was no electronic databases of any kind. There was a convention locator. When you arrive for the convention, you put a card in a card file in the central, one of the central rooms where the staff was. And on that card, you put where you were staying and what the hotel phone number and extension was if anybody wanted to get in touch with you. So we, we started going through all the cards in the card file to identify the people we wanted to invite. And we came up with about 25 names and all the rest of that evening, we started leaving messages for them that there was to be an event at my house and were they interested in coming? And if so, where they could leave a message for us so that we would either pick them up or arrange transportation for them. And so the meet, that meeting took place. I picked up uh, the former director of the psychology clinic, Fred Wyatt. And to my surprise, when he came to get in my car, there, there was a young woman who may have been two or three years older than me, uh, who was by his side. And they were arm in arm and they were laughing together as they got into my car. And I found her very attractive. I started wondering, I knew Fred was married. He had a wife who was in her 60s as he was. What, what is he doing with this person? Is he coming to the convention to having an affair with her? Affairs were very much on my mind. So they came to my house and uh, Fred went off to interact with many other people and the woman was standing by herself. So I found occasions to detach myself from my host duties to giving people drinks and, seeing they had snacks to eat. And I kept cycling by to where she was and talking to her more and more. And it turned out, yes, she was a psychologist, but she was a staff person who worked for the American Psychological Association. And the way she knew Fred Wyatt was, she was assigned to a committee that he had been appointed to. She was the staff person who staffed the committee. She took their minutes, she made their meeting arrangements, she worked out their agenda, if there were documents to be uh, shared between them, she uh, did the Xeroxing and the getting the documents ready. She was their support. And Fred had always been a, a wonderful chronic flirt. And I'm not surprised that he had been flirting with her. And, and when this event came up, he had been at the, the committee meeting with her. He asked her if she wanted to accompany him to the committee meeting so he could continue his flirting with her. And I asked, I was very direct. I said, are you having an affair with him? Oh, she said, I would never do that. And so I knew they weren't having an affair. Uh, as we went back to the hotel at the end of the evening, I drove them back. She said, I enjoyed talking to you. And she gave me her business card. And, and here's my phone number. If you're, if you're ever in Washington again, for any reason, I, I'd be happy to go out to lunch and spend some time with you. And I said, oh, is she coming on to me? And I was suddenly burned with an insane desire. I had to get to Washington. I had no plans to be there. I was probably gonna cycle around. American Psychological Association would meet in Washington every five to seven years and that would cycle around again. But how the hell was I gonna to get to Washington? Well, I'm very inventive when I'm desperate. And at that time, I was president of the Los Angeles Society of Clinical Psychologists. And I had been, of course, networking with the other local associations about what were the problems that APA was causing for us and what could we do about them? Well, there was a big problem. It had been years since the model training for how clinical psychologists should be trained had been running in, in the universities. And APA was hosting a new, new conference. It was a conference on, did the curriculum need to be changed? Are we doing a reasonable job of training or should it be altered in some way? And those of us who were out in the community were furious because the people who were going to debate this were the people who were doing the training. There, there were no clinic psychologists there and there were no people from independent uh, practice who had been invited 
uh, to attend as participants. So we had our own views about the adequacy of how we'd been trained and we wanted to be heard. So we were just in the early stages of planning a descent on the board, APA Board of Directors demanding that they add to the participants of that conference. So that there, were, there would be representation from those of us who were in practice and those of us who were either in agencies or running the psychology departments in agencies. That this was a poor sample of the people who should shape the next 10 years of uh, training in clinical psychology. And we arranged, uh, I cabaled with the other people in the other local association. We arranged a time with the board of directors to come to Washington to attend the board meeting and make our pitch for why they should open up the presentation. I only had to wait about three months from the time I had met her. And I let her know what was happening. I was coming to talk to the board of directors. And uh, I, I had arranged to take off the weekend. They were going to see us on a Saturday morning and my flight back to Los Angeles was on Sunday afternoon. Did she have any free time this weekend? I'd like to take her up on the offer. And she said, well, let me see if I can park my children. You know what, you're gonna be a friend on Sunday. I'll spend the day with you on Sunday. And my desire went totally wild. I'm gonna have a day with her on Sunday. I have to figure out how to get her to greet me by coming up to my hotel room before I even leave the hotel room. I gotta get her into my hotel room. I was all ready to start an affair with her. So she arrived uh, in my hotel room at 10 o'clock in the morning at the appointed hour. She had taken care of her domestic responsibilities and was coming to see me. And I said, come on up. I'm not quite ready, ready, ready yet. I have a few things I have to get together. But you wait in my room instead of the lobby. She said, no, no, I'm not coming up. I'll wait down here. And I said, what am I going to do? How am I going to work this out? She's not coming up to my room. I, I couldn't think of what to do to get her up to my room. So I said, well, let's see what she has in mind. Maybe she has some place that we're going to go. And she said, well, it's almost lunchtime. How about having brunch here in the restaurant? I said, that's fine. I thought maybe I could get her up to my room after brunch. So we had brunch and we both had Bloody Marys. And she said, uh, what would you like to do this afternoon? I said, well, I haven't thought about it too much. What do you think we should do? I said, I have my car. I think we should drive down to Mount Vernon. And I said, well, I've, I've been to George, George Washington's home in Mount, Mount Vernon. My parents took me where, there when I was a kid. And she said, but you've never seen it when, it's, when there's been snow all around. It's very special to go down to Mount Vernon on a, a day like this in December when there's snow everywhere. And I said, well, I don't know if I want to do that again. And she said, oh, come on, be a sport. You'll enjoy it. You'll see how much how worthwhile it is. So I got really glum because I knew we were going to spend 45 minutes at least driving down to Mount Vernon. And then we would take the private tour and then we would get back in the car and we would come back again. And that's what happened. I spent the day touring Mount Vernon. She brought me back to the hotel about four o'clock. And I said, would you like to stop and have a drink before you go home? She said, no, I really have to go home. Thank you for a very pleasant day. And she gave me a kiss on the cheek and pushed me out of the car. And I went back to my hotel room. I was just disconsolate. I had no energy and no goodness. I, I had room service send up a meal because I had time before I had to leave to catch my evening plane back to Los Angeles. And I wanted to eat something. I kept looking out the window and everybody seemed to be in couples on the street down below, walking arm in arm with somebody. And I was all alone and I was lonely at home and I was going back to a sterile home and I had not succeeded in starting a love affair with somebody who seemed so desirable and charming. Well, I'm almost out of my time, so let me cut to the chase on this story. I chased her for two more years. I saw her at every APA convention the divisions of psychotherapy and, uh, and clinical psychology and family psychology started having midwinter conventions so we could meet in smaller groups with each other and present papers. And she was always a participant there. So twice a year, I knew I was going to see her and I chased her and I kept trying to get her up to my hotel room unsuccessfully. And 
what broke my heart is every time I would bump into her, she would always make plans to put aside some time to be with me. Every time there was a meeting that we were going to attend together, an hour or two she would spend with me. We would either go to the bar or drink or we'd have a meal somewhere. She was always charming and flirtatious and desirable. But all the rest of the time, when I bump into her in the hall, she'd be walking arm in arm with some professor I knew or, or some colleague I knew who was in practice. And she would have, be having animated discussions with them and being as animated and wonderful with them and flirtatious with them as she was with me when it was my turn to be with her. And I said, what the fuck am I in the presence of? And I decided I am gonna push her to the limits so the last time I was with her, again, we had made a plan to meet in the context of that particular meeting. And she was going to meet me at the end of the day. We, we were going to get together about 9.30, 10 o'clock in the evening. That was fine with me because where was there to go after me except to bed somewhere? So I was going to be the one who got into that bed with me. So I, I checked where the location of her hotel room was. And she was on a lower floor than mine. So I thought maybe I can pour, let, go up in the elevator with her and help her open the door and be a gallant gentleman escorting her room and then force my way in with her into her bedroom. Uh, that was my plan that I had come up with. And we went to the bar and I said, you're Italian of descent, I'm Jewish. We don't drink much, but I've learned to enjoy scotch a lot. Do you drink scotch? Well, Italians seem to have a reputation for drinking more than Jews do. So are you comfortable drinking a lot? And she said, yeah, I love drinking. I said, how about I'll challenge you to a scotch drinking uh, contest. Let's see who can consume the most shots of scotch. Oh, she said, I'm gonna put you under the bar. I said, oh, no, you're not. You're gonna get drunk out of your mind and I'll still be standing. I figured if she was very drunk, I'd have a better chance of being able to get her in bed. So we started drinking scotches and her speech started slurring. Mine was holding, I, I'm bigger in volume so I can consume <laughs> more shots without damaging myself and she could. My scheme was working and she said, I, I really can't go on. I'm really tipsy, I think I have to get to my room. I said, okay, I won the contest, I'm in chief. I'll take you up to your room. You're having trouble being steady on your feet. Lean on me, let's go to the elevator. I'll get you up to your room. I got her up to her room. I said, you better give it. Well, they had keys then. It was before the magnetic card. You better give me your door key so I can open the lock. And she did. I opened the door for her. And she went in very quickly. And she tried to slam the door, but I already had my leg in the door and my arms up against it. I said, oh, no, you're not going to do that. And I pushed the door open. She was unsteady, she almost fell, but I staggered my way into the room and slammed the room before her and behind her. I said, I do not know what you've been doing with me. I've been trying to have an affair with you and you've been delightful and you've been flirtatious and you seem to be flirtatious with plenty of other men, but tonight I want to spend the night with you. And then, ooh, what I went through. She pulled herself up to the full height and she said to me, what makes you think I would bother with somebody like you? And then she proceeded to recite what she saw were my terrible flaws that would make me an improper and worthless lover to anyone. And she did a whole character assassination act on me. And it hurt. It felt like I was having acid poured on me as I listened to her. And she was imperious and angry and critical. And then inspiration came. And I said, you know what? That's not going to work. You're not going to drive me away. I'm still going to spend the night. And then I could see she got frightened like a deer in the headline. And she started cry, crying. And what came out of her was, get away from me. I'm no good. I'm only going to hurt you. She said, I'm, I'm going to be 40 soon. And I feel my aging. And I'm in a loveless marriage. And I, I daydream a lot of it about being unfaithful or getting a divorce, but I'm a Catholic and I'm going to stay in this marriage and I'm not going to commit adultery. I'm not going to skin. I'm not going to sin. And no matter how appealing you or the other people who come and flirt with me is, 
I'm not going to do any of it. So you know what I am? I'm a cryptease. It's important to me to know that I'm attractive, that I'm beautiful, that I'm intelligent, that men hunger for me, but I'm not going to consummate anything with anybody. I'm going to frustrate all of you because I'm going to remain true to my principles. Now get out of here before I destroy you. And uh, she started to stagger some, and I said, oh my God, she's going to pass out. And I said, she's probably going to pass out, and I could probably have sex with a passed out woman if I wanted to do that, but that didn't appeal to me at all. I wanted a woman who took joy in the fact that I was now present with her. So I tucked her into bed, and I uh, took off her dress at least, put her to sleep. She started snoring, and I took the pad next to the telephone. I wrote her and wrote, thank you so much for being real to me. That was a more precious gift, I think, than maybe what would happen if we had sex with each other. And I will remember this night as I am now for the rest of my life. That was maybe the nicest gift any woman has given me. It was the gift of your truth. And I wish you well. I hope you can find a way through your torment. I'm certainly going to keep trying. I did see her five years later. I was presenting a paper. I had made my journey out of my first marriage. I had remarried and she came up to ask me how I was. And I said, I'm really very good now. I'd like to, come on, I'd like you to introduce me to my wife. I, I got out of what my horror was and my pain. I'm at peace and having a better life than I've known since I became an adult. I hope you've done something. And she said, no, I'm still carrying on the same thing. And I said, I'm sorry for you. My wife has paid me for you, too. I told her the story of what I had lived through with you. At any rate, I learned something from that. And I've seen it in many clients, and this will be my final word for today. Many clients who are struggling with whether they're going to allow themselves to engage in infidelity or not have a radar that picks somebody who's wrong for them or who won't respond. And they wind up coming away frustrated and almost as if uh, they are testing the waters and now they have more reason not to proceed. It, it helps them not to commit adultery, to attempt to commit adultery with somebody who's a bad partner. And that's exactly what I have done. All right, I will stop for the day and turn this over to my colleagues to say something to me about what I presented. First, was it okay that I read? Is that clunky? Stupid? Should I read again on other occasions? What, what's it like to consume my reading? I thought it was uh, very touching and, and I appreciated uh, the, the chapter on Ken. Uh, I, I have uh, uh, two questions in, in, in about the story. One is what made you uh, become receptive to seeing Ken after your experience with him um, at the uh, the center or the or the clinic, and the other thing, the other question. Wait, is could how... I answer that one first before I sure, forget sure. the answer? Sure, no sure. The problem. answer is I had changed my philosophy about what I'm going to do with my practice. I adopted this romantic belief that I've only violated once. That every client mystically who shows up and asks for my services is there for me to learn something important. And Ken had asked for my services. So I was, even though I had had this ridiculous experience with him before, I was going to go find out what I was supposed to learn from Ken. I and see. I did learn something so precious and important. It was the beginning of what's now called mindfulness meditation about paying attention to what is rather than brooding about all the things you're distracted by. All right, what's the second question? The, the second one is is that you didn't mention or talk about any talk about um, the any exploration of his childhood in 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 the course of of your uh, therapy with him. And I'm wondering why. It's because I had had no experience with managing the challenge he gave to me, and I hit upon the best tactic would be to follow his lead and process whatever it was that was on his agenda of things he wanted to be sure that I would pay attention to. And none of it had to do with his childhood and I didn't want to pull at him and send him off in some different direction. 
that would have meaning for me, but might have felt uh, annoying or intrusive to him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for the questions. Those were, those were both uh, very thought provoking for me. Mm. You're welcome. I, I noticed when you spoke, when you, when you first spoke with him, you, you didn't admit, uh, he said he was kind of um, mean to you and you said, oh no, it wasn't that big a deal. I'm wondering if now you would have been more honest with him. No. No? I lie to clients sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> that to me felt like a very kind lie. He, I, see, that was the beginning. He was already starting to just hate himself for mistakes he thinks he may have made it. And that was the first easy testing. He started to be unhappy with himself because maybe he'd been too hard on me. I want to reassure him that everything was fine between the two of us. Yeah. <laughs> and then as far as uh, the affair goes, this, this, this kind of stuff, uh, I, I wanted to give you some advice because this is two years. Uh, don't, don't chase scotch or the ladies. <laughs> well, I've stopped chasing the ladies and I don't drink, currently. so thanks for the advice. It's not needed at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> Buckley, a day late and a dollar a, short. <laughs> uh, I, I did have three more affairs that were quite significant in changing my life, and I will be talking about those in the future, but then it came to an end. I, I met my present wife, and that was 49 years ago, coming up on my 50th wedding anniversary in April. And that restlessness in me got itched and scratched and was not needed anymore. I moved on with my life. But the liquor, I have been intermittently until maybe a few years ago, at times of trouble, had recourse probably to too much liquor. I, don't, I, don't, I was never drunk. I was never impaired by the liquor, but I know enough <clears throat> that liquor burns the esophagus, it can burn the stomach lining, it hurts the liver, and I, I decided it was time to stop causing harm to my body, and I gave up drinking too, so it's gone out of my life. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it now seems as strange as giving up cigarettes has resulted in seems strange. I, I don't understand why anybody does that anymore. Mm -hmm. It just looks odd to me to see people doing it, <clears throat> both cigarettes and alcohol. All right, I guess that's it for today. Thanks for the help. Okay. All right. Yeah. We'll Good get together you guys. next week. We'll Bye. see you next week. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye now.